Hi, this is Brian Wise, and I want to welcome you to The Connection and our new leadership series that we have begun just this week. And, and our first series is, going to, is entitled Emerging from Pandemic. And today we're going to talk about part one, which is the vision. Because the reality is in the midst of, of all the, of this pandemic, and what, no matter what you call it, no matter whether you call it coronavirus or COVID-19, or I've really become fond of, of calling it Rona, you know, Hurricane Rona, you know, we've all had our lives disrupted. We've all had so much of what we have called normal completely turned upside down. Schools are closed. Kids are having to adapt. Parents are having to adapt to e-learning. You know, we're working from home. Businesses are closed. Layoffs. We're, we've been told we need to shelter in place. We've got restrictions on the number of people who can go in grocery stores. We've got church services that have been canceled or, or moved to online or we're, we're pulling in to the parking lot in order to be able to, to see each other from, from one car to another. So much of what we have deemed as critical, necessary, and normal in our lives has been completely disrupted for over a month now. But praise God, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Praise God that we're, all, we're beginning to talk about you know, what it looks like to restart the economy, to, to re reopen things. In fact, President Trump just yesterday you know, announced the, the three phases in which we might be able to, as states can choose to begin to reopen and some guidelines on how we might do that, that we might begin to go back to living life in the fullness, beginning the process of returning to normal. And truth be told, most of us are ready. Man, we are waiting with bated breath. Man, it's like we're all standing at the starting line and we're just waiting for the starter pistols to sound. We're just waiting for somebody to give us the all clear and man, we're going to be off. Man, we're going to be off going back to do the things that we love to do, going back to work and reconnecting with family and friends and getting back to church and giving out hugs. And, and, and as we gradually open things up, all those things are going to return. Man, we're going to you know, talk about going out to lunch with our friends and taking the kids to the park and going to do activities and having family reunion and, and simply re-engaging in those things that make life worth living. And as we prepare to re-engage, as we prepare to begin to start back up, if you will, I think there's some key questions we need to ask ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, what will life look like when we re-engage? What will the new normal look look like for me? What will that look like for my family? What will that look like for, for my business or my, our church? But here's maybe the most important question. What should it look like? What should the new normal look like? It's been a little over two years ago that the Lord gave me a vision. And, and in this vision, I saw this, this, large, this large meeting room. And in, in the meeting room was a long wooden table, a conference room table, if you will, from, from a boardroom back when I worked in the corporate world. You know, those big, long tables. And around the table were chair, business chairs sitting on rollers, sitting all the way around the table. And on the table were, in the center was a vase with flowers. And there were piles of papers neatly piled upon the table and notebooks and books. Around the room, there were you know, bookcases on one wall and filled with books, and on top of the bookcases were, were all kinds of decorations. And, and on the other side was a, a little table with a lamp, and, and there were two side chairs where you could sit and have a little conversation. You know, and on the end, there was a, a, a big whiteboard and, you know, where, where projection could be done. And it looked just like one of those boardrooms. And, and as, I, as I saw this picture, there were men and women sitting around the, all the way around the table. And, and they, it was obvious that they were conducting business. As I watched, a whirlwind began to come into the room. Now, when I talk about whirlwind, I'm not talking about a tornado. I'm, I'm talking about what some might call a dust devil. You know, here in Indiana in the spring, as the farmers are, are working the ground, many times you'll see a, a little whirlwind coming across the field, picking up dust and debris and corn stalks and, and leaves and lifting them into the air. You know, some of those are small, some of those are bigger. And, and there was a, a fairly big whirlwind. But the thing about a whirlwind is, a whirlwind may, is powerful enough to be disruptive, but it's not powerful enough to really cause any destruction. And as I watched that whirlwind begin to come into the room, and, and all the men and women got up, and, and they left the room. And as the whirlwind began to come into the room, suddenly everything began to fly around. The papers were flying everywhere. 
the, the books were sliding across the table. The vase in the center of the table fell over and rolled to the side and the flowers were strewn all over the floor. One of the bookcases fell over and the books were scattered on the floor and the chairs were rolling around and moving and, and the lamp fell over and, 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 the, and all the, everything in that room. And as I watched, everything was being disrupted. And as the whirlwind began to go out of the room, I saw that everything had been moved, everything had been disrupted, everything was no longer in its old place. But even though everything had been moved, nothing had been destroyed. And when the whirlwind was gone, I watched, and the men and women came back into the room, and they stood and they looked around and they assessed what had taken place. And then they got busy. And they begin to pick up all the papers and restack them in the stacks they'd been in. They set up the bookcase. They put all the books back exactly where they were. They put the decorations in the same spot. They picked up the flowers off the floor and put them back in the vase and put them in the center of the table. They rearranged the chairs. They, they set the lamp up. When they were finished, the room looked exactly like it had before the whirlwind had come in. Like absolutely nothing had happened. When the vision ended, it was clear in my spirit that what the Lord was saying to me was that many times when the things in our life get disrupted, when they get moved, when, when things happen, that the temptation, the standard operating procedure for all of our lives is to say we need to put things back the way they were. We need to restore things to exactly as they were before the hurricane, before the, the whirlwind, before the tornado. But what the Lord was saying to me is that when those things happen, it is an opportunity for us to, re to reevaluate, to assess, to look at those things and say, what is it that we should keep and what is it that maybe needs to be different as we move forward? And the reality is, friends, all of us in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all that's been going on around us, we have been given the opportunity. At the time I had that vision, I, I shared it with a couple of close friends. One of those happened to be Ron Meyer, and he was pastor and, um, lead pastor of his church. And, and we talked about that vision and what, what that might mean. But even though there seemed to be a, a, a lot of meaning and a lot of truth in, in that vision, there's never really seemed to be a, an application for it. But that all changed a month ago. See, that all changed because now you and I have lived in a world where absolutely everything in our life, every aspect of our lives has been disrupted. It's been blown around. It's been knocked over. You know, it's no longer in the place or the way it was a month ago, six weeks ago. And the reality is that it's going to take some time for even the, for the doors to be open, for the opportunities to return. But I want to suggest that for most of us, Nothing's been lost. For most of us, nothing's been destroyed. For most of us, you know, nothing has been damaged beyond repair. Life has simply been upended. And even if you've lost your job, one of the 22 plus million people who've lost your job or, or been furloughed or laid off, the reality is that, that as the economy comes back, opportunities for jobs, you say, I, I've lost this, but maybe there's opportunities. And so I believe that for all of us, we, we need to ask the question, especially as leaders, we need to ask the question as we come back into the room, how are we going to reorder life? It's a question that we have to ask across the board. A question we have to ask in our lives, in our families, in, in our communities, in our businesses, on every, our government, every aspect of life. Think about our work life. Think about how work has been upended for so many people. For those who have been deemed essential, for nurses, you know, think about all, and doctors, you know, we've all been aware of all the things that have gone on there. Or we think about grocery workers and, and those who are still on the front lines. But for so many other people, listen to me, you know, you're working from home, you're splitting time at the home or the office, you, you're working with more flexibility than you've ever worked before. You know, I, I saw a statistic this week that, that for those who are still working in the United States, 47% are working from home. The vast majority of them have never worked from home before. You know, I heard someone say this week, they said, man, you know, I, I miss the, inter the personal interaction at work I, at, at the office. I, I miss, 
you know, the structure that we have there. But I'll tell you what, I don't miss that commute there and back every single day. I don't miss that drive. I don't miss, you know, all, some of those other things. Man, it's, it's kind of nice being at home. See, in the midst of all this, we've gotten a new perspective. And I think if we're going to answer that question of one, when we come back into the room, how are we going to reorder things? It's going to be based on perspective that we have. And that our perspective has been changed. How many businesses, think about it in this light, how many businesses have had to create a new paradigm, a, a new way of doing business? Restaurants that were, their dining rooms were closed had to begin to think about you know, how can we do something different? How can we continue to operate at least at some level to serve our customers? You know, I, was, I saw on the news about a, a, game, a game store. They, they had video games, but they also had board games and all kinds of things. And people would come in and play. And, and they had a brand new paradigm of how they were going to go online and how they were going to deliver games and pick up games and, and, and create a whole new segment of their business in the midst of this. You know, businesses providing services to their customers that they've never provided before. And now they have a, a different perspective on the business that they maybe they've run for a long, long time. And so the question becomes, as businesses, as employers, as employees, as things begin to open up, how are we going to reorder? How are we going to go back? What's the new normal going to look like? How can we review? How can we rethink? How can we revisit how it is we're going to conduct business? How it is where and when we're going to do our jobs? Or maybe you are one of those 22 plus million people who've been laid off or deemed your job was deemed unessential. And, and, and thankfully, you know, unemployment or, or the stimulus, stimulus checks or, or savings or, or others helping you, you've been able to survive this storm. And as you look forward, you're begin, you have a new perspective, maybe on your job, maybe on security, maybe on some things. And you're like, maybe, maybe... I love my job and I'm going to go back to that because, man, I thought, what's what I really want to do? But for some of us, maybe it's like, maybe I'm going to look in a different direction. Maybe I'm going to retool. I'm going to look to move in a completely different direction. Your perspective has changed. And in the midst of this, it's time to say, as things begin to open up, what's the new normal going to look like? Think about our families. Our families have been completely changed for most people. Think about it. Schools are closed. Activities are canceled. Sports leagues are shut down. Movie theaters are shuttered. You know, friends and family are, are social distancing. And you have nowhere to go. Your kids have nowhere to go. You know, whether they're small or whether they're teenagers, they're, they're all in the house. I work with a young man uh, who's 17. He said, my mom and dad said, I cannot leave the house. He said, I said, what do you normally do for fun? I hang out with my friends. And, and in their family, all three, all five of them, you know, three teenagers and, and the parents are all in the house together all the time, except when he was at work and he's picked up more hours at work. He said, man, I, I, I love coming to work, but nowhere to go. And as a result, family life has been turned upside down. You and your spouse spend more time, <laughs> spend time together all the time. The kids are there with you all the time. You're all at home all the time. And after the initial shock of that, you know, wore off, guess what began to happen? For a lot of families, in the midst of that, you began to cook more. There's been a shortage of flour at the grocery store and yeast. You can't find those things in a lot of places because people are baking more than ever, many for the very first time because they're at home. You know, you had dinner around the table. You played games together. You went on bike rides together. You had a bonfire in the backyard. You did projects together. You talked to your spouse about stuff that like you at a depth and a level that you haven't talked to her in years or, or him in years and, and maybe ever i heard one mother say I, i'm not sure i've ever spent this much time with my kids and, and she wasn't upset about it and it wasn't that she didn't want to spend time with her kids she just realized you know what i, I don't think i've ever had the opportunity or thought i had the opportunity to spend this much time actually with my kids all at once. Man, through all this, many of us have gotten a brand new, different perspective on family. And as the grip of Rona loosens, as activities begin to start up, as sports leagues gear up, as things come back online, 
How are you going to reorder your life, your marriage, your family? What, what's the new normal going to look like for you? As you come back into the room, how are you going to reorder things? See, I believe we've all been given an opportunity to ask this question. What have we learned? What have we discovered? What have we, what's been revealed? What kind of revelation have we received? You know, what has been validated in, in, our, li- in our community, in our, our country, in our families, in our lives, in our marriages? What kind of things have been revealed that now they've been revealed, we have a different perspective? And as we move forward, what's that mean? And friends, I, I want to suggest that as a pastoral leader, as a leader in the church, Everything that we've been talking about is is true of the church as well. And the reality is to answer the question, what's it going to look like? What's the new normal going to look like? We've got to understand that's going to be different from business to business. That's going to be different from church to church, from family to family, from marriage to marriage, to you know, from individual to individual. Why? Because God's created us all differently. He's all wired us differently. He, he has all, given all of us a different call, and he's called us to different things. But we all have the same opportunity in the midst of this to say, Lord, what is it that you have for me now? What is it you, you want to do? And one of the things that's really on my heart, and I believe was the intent of the original vision, was this. What's this mean for the church? What's it all mean? Because has the church, everything that we have known as life as normal for, for many of us, for all of our lives, has been turned upside down? We're no longer gathering on Sunday mornings right now, you know, in, in a particular building, in a particular room. What are we doing? We're having online service. We're doing Facebook Live. We're, we're doing Zoom. We're doing Bible study and, and Sunday school and small groups on Facebook Live or on Zoom. You know, we're having, we're doing visitation on, on, on FaceTime. You know, how, how many of us ever thought about that in the past? We're, we're just going to FaceTime Sally and, and instead of going by her house. You know, we're doing so many different things. We're, I, I've watched pastors who are doing daily devotional videos for, for their, their folks in their church. I've, I've watched churches having daily prayer meetings at noon via Facebook Live. You know, Bible study groups doing things, having nightly Facebook family, <laughs> nightly devotional chats. You know, children's ministry, putting together content for the kids in in their congregation, for them to watch a video and see some things at home, reading Bible stories to kids at night, all kinds of things of embracing technology and doing things in a virtual manner. And man, we've been seeing God move in in, in a lot of different ways. Man, Man, I know a church that they weren't really embracing technology much at all. In fact, they didn't have a Facebook page. Um, you know, they were still using burning CDs for those who had missed a message. You know, hey, we'll drop one off or, or you know, you can pick one up the next week. But when all this happened, man, they stepped up. And, and they went out and, and they, they created a Facebook, <clears throat> private Facebook page so that they could connect all the people within the life of their church who were a part of their church family. Last time I looked, that was 170 people that they had on this Facebook private page. And, and they began to do all their services via Facebook Live. They were doing Sunday morning. They were doing their adult Sunday school class. They were doing Wednesday night Bible study. They were doing their small groups on Sunday night. Everything was happening on Facebook Live. And their Sunday school, their one adult Sunday school class, typically had 20, 25. Sometimes on a good day, they had 30 who would come to Sunday school before worship. And the teacher began to do you know, Sunday school on Facebook Live. And on the third week, they had 103 people join in the Sunday school. They were teaching on intercessory prayer. 103 people joined during that 45 minutes that they were doing the Facebook Live for Sunday school. Four times the attendance they normally would have if people were there in the sanctuary. But that's not the best part of the story. The best part of the story is that they were te- the teacher was talking about intercessory prayer and he started to tell this story about how he and his wife 30 years ago had met some, some young girls, three young girls, and, and they were living with their grandmother and so they started picking them up on Sunday mornings and bringing them to church and they loved on those girls and prayed for those girls and spoke into those girls and as the girls began to grow and became teenagers, they stopped coming to church and, and, and they, they lost track of what happened to these girls. In fact, they hadn't seen them for over 20 years now. But he was telling the story about how him and his wife continued to pray for those girls 
on a regular basis, continue to intercede for those girls. Hadn't seen them in 20 years and kept praying for them. And in the midst of Sunday school, in the midst of that Facebook Live, one of those young ladies messaged in and she said, I've been looking for you. I've been trying to figure out how to get a hold of you because I'm tired of living the life I'm living. I want to live for Jesus and I need a Bible to help me. They messaged a little bit and after Sunday school was over, this gentleman and his wife, they, they got a Bible and they went to her house. In the midst of the coronavirus, it didn't matter. Someone needed to know Jesus went over to their house, her house and was able to minister to her and her two children. Something that, that God used something completely out of the box to reach a young woman and her two kids. In our own church, on, for Easter, we decided we were going to do Zoom. We decided we were going to try and get everybody together, so we worked all week trying to get, make sure everybody could get connected and that everybody had the right software and they knew how to do it. And, you know, we were able to connect one guy um, who's on disability and because of physical issues is not able to get to church. We got him connected on his smartphone and, and there in his living room in the chair where he spends the majority of his time. And, and, and I watched during the midst of the service him constantly wiping the tears from his eyes. And at the end of the service, he just began to weep. So grateful, so thankful that he could see everyone, that he could in, in, hear their voices, that he could participate and engage in what was going on in the life of the church, in the body, in the family that he loved. There was another woman in our church who, who didn't have any internet access, and we've been doing a lot of online content of which she, she couldn't get access to any of it. And so Sunday morning, we, via Zoom, you can dial, you can just come in and call in um, via audio. We got her hooked up, and, and she was able to, to talk and share and, and hear what was going on in the service. And afterwards, she just thanked me over and over and over again that she got to participate in the life of the service. I want you to understand, we've got a brand new perspective. We've got a different perspective now. And as I look forward, how, how in the world can we no longer use the tools that are available to us to not connect people who may not be able to be here, that they might be able to join in and participate in the life of the, of the family of God? See, those are just a couple of, of the thousands, probably millions of stories of how God has been at work in the midst of this pandemic, of how he's been using technology, has been, how he's been giving us new perspectives, how he's been revealing things, how he's begun to illuminate things and begin to show us things. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, as we begin to come back in the room, as restraints begin to be loosened up, as things begin to open up, how are we going to reorder life? What kind of things in our lives, in our church, in our, in our local church as individuals are we going to begin to embrace? My good friend Ron Meyer put it to me this way. He said, many times Jesus would go off to a solitary place to pray. And when Jesus came out of that solitary place, he operated in signs and wonders and, and, and brought revelation and teaching. You know, revealed things of the kingdom and, and of God. And his question was, the church, the body of Christ, we have been involuntarily put into isolation, into a solitary place. And shouldn't we come out of that solitary place after several weeks of being there, you know, more ready, more equipped, better able to carry on the ministry of Jesus, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to bring glory to the King? And then he asked this question, he said, but will, will she? Will the, big, will the church, the big C, will we come out that way? Will we be different? Will, will, will we, here's the next question, you know, will, will the local church, will I, will I as a leader, will I as a, a husband, as I as a father, as I, uh, will we as families, will we come out in a greater way that we might be better, our, our spiritual lives, our faith will be stronger and more prepared than we were when we went in? that we might bring greater glory to the king? It's an interesting question. And I just want to challenge you today, at a personal level, 
I want to challenge you at a family level, at a business level, as a community level, as a local church level, as, as, the, as, as the body of Christ, as the big C level. I just want to challenge you for all of us just to get before the Lord, especially as leaders, to get before the Lord and say, Lord, as we come back into the room, what do you want to do? How do you want me to order things? How, how do you want us to prioritize things? How do you want us to create this? Lord, we want to be men and women. We want to be families. We want to be churches. We want to be a church. We want to be the bride of Christ that is soft and pliable, that you could mold and shape us into that which you desire in the out of the midst of this, that we might take the form that you desire, that our that we would become the new thing that you desire, the better thing that you desire, that we might bring greater glory to you, and that we might more fill the entire earth with your glory. But I want to suggest to you, friends, that's not going to happen by accident. That's going to happen with intentionality. Lord. Show me. Holy Spirit, show us what it is that you desire for us. Show us what it is you desire on the, as we come out of this, as we come out of the cave, as we come out of the solitary place, as we come out of this time of isolation. Lord, what is it that you want to show us? And Lord, help us to be all you want us to be. Let's just pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you speak to your sons and daughters. And Lord, that in the midst of this, Lord, you didn't create this. Lord, you didn't create the virus. But Lord, you redeeming in the midst of that which the, the enemy created for evil. You're redeeming this time and saying, I'm going to use it to bring my bride, to bring my church, to bring my sons and daughters, to bring bring all my people into a better place, into a greater place, into more alignment that they might walk more fully in who I've created them to be. Not because I'm angry, but because I love them. And so, Lord, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you just work in each of our hearts, each of our lives, for everyone who's watching this video. Lord, I pray that you would just minister to them, and Lord, you would speak to them, and Lord, you would do a, a mighty work in them to reveal the things that you have for them. Lord, that, and they're not going to compare themselves to one another, they're not going to compare themselves to somebody down the street, but Lord, that together we would be who we were created to be, and then when we join together, when we are in unity with one another, Lord, that we would operate in the fullness of who you've created us to be. Lord, we, our heart cries out, we want all that you have for us. We thank you for that, Lord. We give you glory and praise in your mighty name. Amen. Friends, I just want to thank you for watching. Um, look forward to part two where we're going to talk about responding to revelation. Those things that God has revealed to us in the midst of this. How is it that we might respond to him and, and move forward as he would desire for us to do. God bless you and have a great day. Amen.